Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, so I was um, surprised to hear all the um, talks so far, just how, how many of them and how much of it is um, uh, related to what I'm talking about. So, uh, so anyway, let's start with um, Hong Kong. This is a city we all know and love. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with it. But I'm sure that it won't be too, it's not too long before you feel like that you're stuck in a concrete jungle. So what I'd like to do is um, take you on a hike. A hike that would take us up uh, north to the border. And um, as we get to near the border at Fan Ning, uh, turn right. And from, from there, take a bus to the seaside, uh, which is actually the, a bay. It's called Sato Gok. And on this side of Hong Kong, uh, Sato Gok, is um, a country park. And within it, uh, about a 90-minute walk from the uh, bus stop, is a valley. And in the valley is uh, a village. Now, as well as being on a hike, my, my hiking expedition is, is quite special because I'm taking you back in time as well. So we're all going to be time travelers for the next few minutes. So imagine going back where this is the view that I get in the morning if I want to hike up to the top of the hill. Down there is Satogat. And just on the left there is a little village. You can just barely see the buildings. Those buildings are uh, built by my ancestors. Uh, they are called um, Hakas. Hakka means guest people. Because um, originally, the Hakas um, uh, fled northern China or central China when the Mongols invaded China and took over northern China and, and just uh, killed anything that moved, really. There, <laughs> there's not much uh, um, mercy with the Mongols. And as a result, the last uh, emperor of the Song Dynasty fled. And he came all the way down, down till he reached Hong Kong. And with him came all the, the no nobility and the uh, common people who, 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 you know, to save their own lives, they just had to run for it. Um, so if you think about it, that's the history of mankind. It's always been about warfare and running away to save yourselves. And you know, even now as we sit, you know, the, uh, what, what's happening in the Middle East, the refugees, you know. So the Hakkas were those, the lucky ones. They fled. And when they got to the, the, here in Satogat, they crossed over and found a valley in which they could uh, live and settle down and live. And um, uh, they started farming. They built houses, fish farming. Uh, they raised pigs and uh, grew rice. Those, uh, the, it used to be a marsh there, <clears throat> and they converted that into paddy fields, and they grew rice. So, what, the Hakkas are, uh, are, are tough people. They're survivors, you know? And uh, they, through the years and decades and the generations, they pretty much uh, lived as, as uh, subsistence farmers in this valley. And nothing changed. And throughout the history of China, up right up into the 20th century, right through the wars and famines and the ep epidemics, but the 20th century was something different. The scale and the intensity of conflict is just beyond anything that people experienced before. Think about that. We had the uh, the uh, uh, revolution. We, they over overthrew the Manchu em uh, Empire. It's a civil war, invasion with, uh, from Japan. Um, communists against the nationalists. So millions and millions of people died. You know, the Second World War alone, you know, 20 million Chinese people died in, uh, as, as a result of that conflict. Now, when it came to uh, uh, the 1960s, that's when Hong Kong became industrialized. And the British, they relaxed their immigration rules, the laws, and allowed people from the new territories to emigrate to Britain. So given a chance to go somewhere where they could start a, a new life, the Hakkas, um, you know, they're, they're, that's, that's in the genes, you know, to, to, to um, pack your bags and go somewhere uh, different, uh, go somewhere new where they might explore opportunities and so on. So they did. And they, a lot of them left uh, Hong Kong and the new territories, ended up in Britain. And in Britain, they worked the way around all the 
uh, Chinese communities, and slowly they migrated north. And uh, they, they, in the end, my family and the clan from the village here and the surrounding villages, they all ended up in, in um, Scotland. There are now more Hakka people in Scotland than there are in the new territories, I think. I know in this case it's true for my village. So, but back then, um, the Hakkas, when they first got to uh, Hong Kong, and a lot of uh, southern China as well, they found very remote valleys, like this valley, Kokpo. So if you stood here on the top of the hill and looked down, you could have seen the people moving in here in Kokpo, along there, Yongshu Ao, and along the peninsula to Solopun. And this area with about seven uh, villages, they formed a network, a community. And that community thrived, you know. They, they traded with each other. They, the pe people married each other. You know, they, uh, uh, they, everyone was related to someone within the, that community. And Satogok there was the center, as it were, the market town. So you could go there. If you had the pig, you know, you just raised a pig. So you load it onto the boat, cross over. You can see the pier. Uh, this is a new one, but there was an old one there. Cross over there uh, and sold it at the market. So they, they, you know, a, lot, a lot went on. Life wasn't just about um, the big city in Hong Kong, uh, in Central or Kowloon. Life was here as well, you know, in small communities. And these communities were you know, uh, traditional. They, they had traditional ways of doing things. And it, and it, it was fine. So. This is a close-up of Sahagot, which is now. Here is an alleyway. It's not much wider than this, this stage here. Alleyway with lots of shops, small shops. And it's called Zhongying Gai, which is China and England street. And a lot of tourists go there now to see what it used to be like. Because on this side of the street, that's say here, on this side, is Britain, the Hong Kong, the colony. On that side of the street, literally, was China. So in between, people just walk back and forth. You're either in China or England, just depending on your, how you like it, you know? So um, now, the Hakkas, they had their own distinctive traditions and uh, architecture. This is a, a, a panorama that I took of the um, Tulo village in Fukien. And uh, it doesn't really show the, the encircle, encirclement, as it were. But by building a, a house like that, where there are lots of uh, different rooms, each, each room or each, uh, yeah, each compartment will house the whole family. Right? So there's a whole community here within this too long. And nowadays, um, not many people, except old people and very young, are left, left living in these places and lots and lots of tourists. This is a, a modernized series of terrace houses uh, in my village. So I don't have a nuclear missile in my, in my back garden. Instead, this is a kind of like um, uh, almost Western style. Uh, this was built in the 70s. This one here is older. You can see the tile roofs and traditional um, um, feng shui uh, symbol, the back gua. Typically, the, the houses are built for living in a farm. And um, so the architecture is quite different from what we have here in, nowadays in Hong Kong. Nowadays, you're lucky to have a concrete box of, what, two or 300 square feet. There, these houses have really high ceilings because they're good for storage and for keeping the, the airflow going. Uh, you know, so Hong Kong summers can get really hot and sticky. Unfortunately, once you leave them, the termites move in, and they start eating away at uh, the roof timbers, the beams. And once those go, your whole roof fall in. And this is, this is my, uh, similar to what I have in my house. Once that goes, that's it. You lose the place. Ah, irrigation. That's very important uh, in farming, and especially in my village. I had to re -re uh, reconnect the old water pipes I found new pipes and, re and replaced the old ones, which are all rusted through. This is the reservoir in the hillside, 
where the tr uh, people got their water from. And every year, the, the storm would come along and fill the place with, fill the whole reservoir with sand and rubble and, and rocks. And every year, I have to dig it out. And th last year, um, th we had the big storm in May. And overnight, just one night, the rocks just filled all the way up to the back. And I gave up because my back just can't take it anymore. <laughs> Here I've got friend. Uh, here's me digging it out, and the friend who's uh, laughing at me. That was way back in 1988. But the the payoff is I get my own water supply. This is my my shower um, in cold and hot weather. Great and hot. Uh, hydrotherapy I call it because you get this blast of cold water from the mountain, which is really refreshing. It's in the summer. It's well worth it. This is my garden just in front of the house. I grew papayas and uh, bananas. Bananas, yeah, they're great. Uh, but sometimes you get too much of a good thing. I get a whole glut of them. And the last couple of years, I've had to try to think of all kinds of ways to, to dispose of extra bananas. So anybody who visits me will, get, will be given a, a big cluster of uh, bananas and say, please take one. Because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, they, they're great. They, they just keep on growing and growing. This is me at the organic fair in Central. I was trying to uh, sell as many bananas as I could. And I went on a radio show even to, to flog my bananas. <laughs> in fact, if they were ripe, I would have brought a suitcase for them. I used a suitcase to chuck them along here. And uh, if, if, they, if I had some ripe ones, I would have brought them and sold them off here. <laughs> Ah, exotic fruit. That was uh, uh, f a fruit I picked up from Thailand. Uh, it originally came from Vietnam. It's the most disgusting fruit you can imagine. It's so bitter. It's more bitter than anything you can imagine eating. Um, you know, even Chinese medicine is not as bitter as this fruit. <laughs> hellfires. Uh, back in the, the, my village, uh, it's surrounded by hills. Uh, a year and a half ago, uh, somebody set the hills on fire. And I thought, what, you know, I was really annoyed because I watched this fire burn and it almost reached my village. And then a, uh, a few weeks later, I looked at it and I thought, surely there's something I can do to, to um, you know, make it better. Now I found a, a nearby uh, stand of uh, Castanopsis fissa. Uh, and uh, they produce these acorns, large acorns, and they're native to China. So that was a perfect combination that I needed to, to plant. Except you've got to climb all the way up to the hill with a bag of acorns and plant them by hand, which I've done. And some of them are, are growing up, so I'm really happy with that. But you, as you can see here, this is what happened to the vegetation. I'll get So, uh, yeah, rocket stoves. Good, it's great, great idea for um, getting some hot water if you want to have a hot bath in a cold night. So rocket stoves, and I got the idea from YouTube. So without that, I would, I would never have figured out that you can use a simple metal pipe to build your own rocket stove, uh, which works really well. And the ash is good fertilizer as well. People often ask me, what do I use to get around the place? And I said, yeah, I've got boats, I've got bicycles, I can walk. So that was my first boat. It was a, 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 a sampan with a little motor attached. And uh, it got destroyed by the storm, so I had to buy a second one. Just enough to get me across the bay. <laughs> it's a toy boat. But uh, unfortunately, um, people, somebody stole my, my motor um, last year. I had to buy another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's a fact of life. If you have something, anything really, it doesn't have to be valuable. Somebody will come along and nick it. Um, yeah, now, it, it doesn't take too long when you live in my village and be surrounded by nature that you get entered into this, what I call a spiritual realm. So that very soon you start to appreciate what nature is about, you know, and it, it triggers off something in, in your soul. And that's really the most important lesson I have to bring here is that, yeah, you really have to listen to your soul because without it, you know, you're just a robot, you know, living in, in a concrete jungle. And that's not really living. This guy came back three weeks ago, and he bought himself a chainsaw. And he started cutting down all the trees around the village and burning up old stuff. 
and burning up the, the trees. And yeah, uh, that's, that's why I can't give you a Hollywood ending because if you go there now, as we speak, as I speak here, he's using his chainsaw to cut down the trees. And um, uh, I, I uh, tried to argue with him, I re reasoned with him, but somebody told him that it's good feng shui to cut down the trees in front of the village. So that's all he needed. That's the only excuse he needed to cut, start cutting down trees. You know, it's like the, you know, in, in Japan, the fishermen in the cove, have you anyone seen that? Where the fishermen uh, corralled all the dolphins and just killed them and sold them off to aquariums. And people ask him why. Well, we can. We can just do what we like. We can kill them. We can chop down the trees. Yeah, we can. I do it because I can. And really, so my final que um, question to, to you, that you represent the next generation, okay? It's your choice whether what some of you, one of you, may one day have, be in a position to make a choice between cutting down all the trees and building up blocks and blocks and blocks of concrete flats or whatever, or be creative and do something creative with the world, you know? That's it. Thank you.